We do not have one rule for Republicans and another rule for Democrats. We don't have one rule for foes and another for friends. We don't have one rule for the powerful and another for the powerless, for the rich or for the poor or based on ethnicity. We have only one rule. And that one rule is that we follow the facts and the law and we reach the decisions required by the Constitution and we protect civil liberties. Hi again, everyone. It's now 5 o'clock in New York. It's simple and in normal times, barely even news to say those things, right? There's one rule of law to govern all of the people in this country. One rule of law to hold ourselves to so that someone does break a law, there's a relatively easy line to distinguish between right and wrong. Consequences. It is that very rule of law, that never-ending fact-based pursuit of fairness that is under direct attack over and over and over again by the four times indicted, twice impeached ex-president. It is why he faces four criminal indictments and multiple other legal challenges. It is why prosecutors have now requested a nearly unprecedented gag order to be placed on him in one of the federal investigations underway. On September 5th, federal prosecutors working in Jack Smith's office on the election subversion case requested Trump be prevented from making, quote, inflammatory and intimidating comments about those involved in that case. Seeing as how Trump is no ordinary person or defendant, he kept doing it every single day. He made comments about his former AG, Bill Barr, his former Vice President, Mike Pence. He has even now suggested that the now former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, be executed. Those specific named threats and criticisms against individuals who were cited as witnesses in the indictment were so serious in the view of Smith's team that they felt the need to speak out once again, to reinforce their filing and their request for a narrowly tailored gag order. In a brand new filing from the office of a man who rarely makes his views public, quote, the defendant should not be permitted to continue to try this case in the court of public opinion rather than in the court of law and thereby undermine the fairness and integrity of this proceeding. The filing goes on, quote, all it would limit is the defendant's use of his candidacy as a cover for making prejudicial public statements about this case. And there is no legitimate need for the defendant in the course of his campaign to attack known witnesses regarding the substance of their anticipated testimony or otherwise engage in materially prejudicial commentary in violation of the proposed order. Now, just hours before this supplemental filing was released, the judge in the case, Judge Tanya Chutkin, scheduled a hearing to discuss this possible potential gag order. It's two weeks from today on October 16th. As Judge Chutkin, who is all too familiar with Trump's attacks on judges and those involved in these proceedings, whether they be potential witnesses or prosecutors or even the judge herself, had an audience captive audience who, in some cases, feel the need to act on his words. Case in point, that woman in Texas who was arrested for threatening the life of Judge Tanya Chuckin. And that was just one of the many death threats faced by those on the other end of Trump's vitriol. Concerns and political, about political violence that are so urgent and so troubling, Attorney General Merrick Garland grew emotional when he was asked about him last night. People can argue with each other as much as they want and as vociferously as they want. But the one thing they may not do is use violence and threats of violence to alter the outcome. An important aspect of this is the American people themselves. The American people must protect each other. They must ensure that they treat each other with civility and kindness, listen to opposing views, argue as vociferously as they want, but refrain from violence and threats of violence. That's the only way this democracy will survive. It's where we start the hour with some of our favorite reporters and friends. New York Times Washington correspondent Glenn Thrush is back with us, plus editor-at-large for The Bulwark, Charlie Sykes is here, and with me at the table... A, re a reunion of sorts. We haven't seen you in a while. Former assistant U.S. attorney and Westchester County District Attorney Mimi Roca is here. Um, Mimi, let's start with um, the attorney general's very emotional response to that last question. I mean, this is where we are, where we're saying 
hate all my policies, hate my leadership of the department, just don't threaten my workforce with violence. That is exactly where we are. It, it, I'm just hearing him, he sounds like someone from a bygone era, Merrick Garland, yeah. and he's so sincere, you know, and it's amazing to me that he is a man that Trump and his defenders are trying to paint as political, Merrick Garland, um, when in fact he is everything and anything but. He is a, trying to defend the institution of the Department of Justice. He's a person, he talked, I believe, in that interview very um, publicly uh, and, and emotionally about the fact that his parents escaped uh, from the Nazis, and that is, it, which my father did as well. And, and that inherently in and of itself is going to make you so fearful about the idea of political violence, because when you put politics, the criminal justice system and violence together, that's when you end up without a democracy. And um, it is just absolutely stunning, as you say, that this is where we is where we are, that the bar is literally just Let's not threaten the prosecutors. Let's not threaten the judge. Let's have discourse in a civil way. Let's let cases play out in the criminal justice system the way that they should. Maybe, maybe you win, maybe you lose, but we have courts, we have laws, we have evidence for a reason. I mean, Charlie, we should always be very specific, and you and I always are. We are not all there. One of the two parties is there. The Democrats get indicted and no one threatens the Justice Department. No one goes to shoot up the FBI. They don't issue an unprecedented bulletin from the Department of Homeland Security saying NARA, IRS. I mean, every government institution that has even an ancillary role in any effort to investigate or hold Trump accountable faces an historic level of threat against their workforce. And the people that work at those companies have unprecedented threats against their children. This is not normal, and I, I, I think calling for civility is, a, is, a, is, you know, to Mimi's point, is from a bygone era. But I, I, I wonder if the moment is almost leapfrog past a point where we can sort of talk it out. What, what did you think of, of the attorney general last night? Well, and, and, and the threat level is rising. You know, I, as I was listening to that, I was thinking, I think Mimi was absolutely right. It did feel like it was uh, from a bygone era. But I was you know, watching how emotional he got as he made an appeal for civility that I feel like five minutes ago would not have been controversial at all. I mean, take a, a transcript of what he just said. There's nothing political or ideolo ideological or partisan about what he said. There's no reason for somebody like a Ted Cruz to, to attack him for all of that. But you know, as he was speaking, it was almost as if he had a sense that uh, this, this tradition of civility of respect was slipping away, that something had broken, something that was very, very valuable, something that we had taken for granted um, was in fact um, being destroyed or being undermined. Because ag again, simply saying that in our democracy, we should be able to have vigorous debates, but do not threaten violence against one another. I mean, that would have been almost a cliche a few years ago, but now, it is, you know, urgently necessary and unfortunately marks a dividing line in our politics. Glenn, I wonder if you can take me inside the department's decision to be more public and, and to speak out in this interview. Well, I think it all goes back to the testimony last week that he gave before Congress, before the, uh, the, the House Judiciary Committee, which was sort of a, a bit of a debacle. It's kind of hard to get the debacle straight. We had the one with the <laughs> impeachment hearing. I'm trying to remember if it was actually, no, it was the week before last. I'm sorry, my debacles <laughs> colliding with, with each other. <laughs> they um, sort of intersect. But, they, don't, they don't even collide. They're, they're like almost like elliptical, like one barely ebbs and then another one commences. And um, for anyone keeping track at home, we're on to the Gates versus McCarthy debacle this week. So you will be, you will be excused for, for mixing them up, Glenn. Well, I'm going up to Wilmington tomorrow. That's a totally different debacle. <laughs> no, the, different the, story. So, so that's a totally separate debacle track. No, so Garland prepared basically for 10 days for that grilling that he took before the ju Judiciary Committee. And I think he is starting to understand something that those of us who's, who've covered politics for a long time are starting to understand. And that is while these buildings that 
he inhabits and judges inhabit are made out of marble and granite and appear to be the most substantial things in the world, they are resting on consensus. You have to have a public consensus over fact, truth, and justice. And what he is sensing, and again, it isn't just, he talks quite emotionally about his family's experience with the Holocaust. I was with him a year and a half ago on Liberty Island when he gave a, a, a really passionate speech about what his family had gone through. But let us not forget that in the late 1990s, Garland was in the department and helped prosecute the Oklahoma City bombers. So he has seen in his entire career, much of it lately spent on the bench before he was he took over DOJ, dealing with the residue of political violence. And this is what is going to define this man's life, his career. Uh, and he is experiencing in a very firsthand way uh, the kind of caustic environment that is creating the rhetoric that is driving both threats and, in rarer circumstances, the actual violence itself.